start the recording. Okay, there are people are coming. <clears throat> we are already at 32. Wonderful. We have more than 50 registered participants. And, and, and usually not all of them come to, <laughs> to join the, the webinar, but let's wait a minute until the, everybody has uh, an opportunity to, uh, to join us. And then um, I will introduce the, the speaker and, um, and we can start. Okay, okay. I think the, the, the numbers are, are, are converging nicely. So, <clears throat> So maybe we can um, we can. Start. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the to the NITEP um, uh, colloquium on this uh, Monday afternoon. At least in this part of the world, not in the part of the world where the speaker is, is at the moment. But we'll come back to that just now. So today's speaker is is Robert de Mello Koch, and uh, he is probably known to to all the South African participants. He's based at the um, at University of the of the Witz, Witz, Rand, Witz, Witz Rand, sorry, the S, it's the, not that after the Witz, but comes later, Witwatersrand. And he's a um, DST uh, or DSI maybe now, NRF, Research Chair in Fundamental Physics and String Theory. And he's also a distinguished professor at the South China Normal, Normal uh, University. And that's where he's, uh, based at the, at the moment. And um, a few weeks ago, or uh, yeah, probably a month or so ago, I saw the, the, the paper of Robert on, uh, on the uh, relationship between uh, deep learning and uh, renormalization group. And I thought that would be a, a very interesting topic that brings together the, 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 the theoretical physics community and the machine learning, artificial intelligence <coughs> uh, community. And, uh, you know, and out of this connection, there's always something interesting and new emerging that might uh, attract the interest of more, of more people. Uh, Robert, so I'm very happy that, um, <coughs> that you're here with us this afternoon for us and this evening uh, for you. <coughs> and if you want to start sharing your screen, um, you're welcome to start Thanks. with your presentation. On, on our panel, sorry, before, before I forget, there is also uh, Dr. Ilya Sinaiski, who will help uh, moderating the, the, the question and answer session. And um, most of you are probably expert uh, Zoom webinar participants and know that there is a, a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you're welcome to, to pose your, your, your questions there. <clears throat> and Ilya will try to, to moderate them after the, the talk of, uh, of Robert uh, is over. So Robert, thank you very much. We can see your, 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 <coughs> your slides now, and you're welcome to start with your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much, Francesco. Okay, so the talk uh, today is based on work that I did together with my sister, Ellen, and her supervisor, Lin Cheng, and our joint MSc student, Anlu Conway. So I'm sure by now everybody has seen the um, impressive uh, results achieved by deep learning that have made it into the news. So at this point, deep networks are able to beat the world champion at uh, the game Go. Uh, deep networks are able to spot cancer tumors inside x-ray images and other biomedical images. They can cause the same level that humans can cause. They can do transmissions at human level. They're starting to drive cars at human level. So it's clear that artificial intelligence is going to make a big breakthrough in our everyday lives. Uh, artificial intelligence is also being used to do science, to spot new types of materials, design new types of drugs, and even spot new phase transitions in condensed matter. And one thing that I would like to point out right now is artificial intelligence is a bit of um, an old terminology. It is used a lot of news, but people who work in this field sort of refer to deep learning and they would say that they are doing deep learning. For the purpose of this talk, whenever I talk about artificial intelligence, deep learning, we should take those two things as being completely equivalent. Okay, now this is a little fun thing. You can Google yourself, so you can Google talk to someone. 
um, you'll be able to access a deep network strained on many thousands of articles pulled from the web and from various other sources. And what you can do with Torchform is you give it a first sentence and then the deep network will try to complete this and produce a story. So I gave this network, it was a warm summer day, after it returned, first I donned the soft towel, then I lay down to rest, it was almost like a day of rest after my deal of being hunted by demons in the deep dungeon, but being awakened by a heat wave from another world wasn't fun. And so it continues. You can see from this that if somebody was to complete your sentence, this way it was the on day and give this paragraph, you would assume this is someone who is a native English speaker, who's got quite good command of the language, who's got a relatively good um, imagination, and this was all done by a computer, so really quite remarkable. Despite all of the success, however, we don't really know how the actually works. So what I'm showing you here is an article that was published in Science Magazine, and the title of this article is Has published Competitions Become Alchemy? And the article was based on a talk given by Ali Rahim. Let me share the start of the article with you. So Ali Rahimi, uh, oh, let me just get rid of that. Ali Rahimi, a researcher in artificial intelligence, California, the type this field last December. So that's December 2017, and received a 40 second standing ovation for it. Speaking at a AI conference, he charged that machine learning algorithms in which computers learn through trial and error, have become a form of algorithm. Researchers, he said, do not know why some algorithms work and others don't, nor do they have rigorous criteria for choosing one AI architecture over another. And so it continues. This actually forms um, a lot of the motivation for why I got into the field, because it turns out that there's a lot of interesting issues. So with that motivation, let me tell you what is the overview of my talk. I'm going to start by telling you what machine learning is. I'm a relatively newcomer to the field. A little while ago, I would not have understood at all what is machine learning. So I want to give you just a few slides saying what is machine learning. I then want to talk about some open questions, there's some partial answers, and the open questions that I've chosen, the partial answers I will review, will actually motivate the third part of the talk, which is to ask the question, is deep learning an RG flow? And here RG stands for renormalization group. So let's start off. What is machine learning? Okay, so machine learning basically is learning patterns from data. You can think of it as curve fitting. Imagine you're in a lab, you have a piece of apparatus, and what this apparatus is, it's very crude, it's a box. You know exactly the volume of the box and the volume can be adjusted. Uh, there's a thermometer in the box. You know the temperature of some gas that's stored in the box, and you can also measure the French pressure of that gas. So if you do a sequence of measurements, you can get a whole list of triples of numbers some pressure together with the volume, together with the temperature. And if you decide to plot these triples inside this three-dimensional space of pressure, volume, and temperature, you find that the data lies nicely on a surface. And this surface is described by the equation PV is equal to a constant times T. Uh, the advantage of having this surface is that if you now choose a volume that you've never studied before, a temperature that you've never studied before, it'll define a point on the surface and you can predict what pressure you would measure. This is a classic uh, idea of curve fitting. So let's come now to deep learning and let's see what kind of curve fitting we're doing in that situation. So in this situation, my data could be a sequence of pictures and each picture in the sequence is labeled as either dog or cat. So dog, I can assign a value naught, and cat, I can assign a value one. 
I train the machine on the sequence of pictures. There might be 10,000, 20,000 pictures. Once I've trained my network, I'd like to pick up a picture that the network hasn't seen before and ask the network, is this a dog or is this a cat? Now, before you start off, you, you might wonder, will there even be a solution? These pictures are not a very good way to encode dog or cat. If you look, for example, at the second image of dog, it's on a green background and it looks like some orange leaves. And all of this background is completely irrelevant information. You could equally well have had a cat sitting there. Look at the last picture of the cat. It's got some uh, peculiar lighting behind the cat, but that could very well be a dog with peculiar lighting behind it. If you look at the first picture on this list, this is a dog that's been keeping up with the news of so wearing a face mask to protect itself from COVID-19. But it could equally well have been a cat that was keeping up with the news wearing the face mask. So there's a lot of information here that the computer must somehow figure out how will it discard. And it's not even clear that there is a nice solution to this problem. In fact, if you train a computer to do it, we found out computers can classify pictures as dog or cat better than human can. There is a nice solution. Of course, in this problem, you don't expect that there's an elegant law for what it means to be a cat or a dog. But in the previous curve that we discussed, there was a nice elegant law describing the data, ideal gas law. In this case, there's not going to be an elegant law. And in fact, it's very, um, you know, even the question lacks some clarity. I mean, you can get some breeds of dogs that you can really ask, are you really talking about a dog or a cat? And there's also some breeds of cats where it's not clear if this is a dog or a cat. So even the question itself is not very well defined in certain corners. Machine learning usually talks about these kinds of questions that are rather complicated and not very exact. Okay, so how do we solve this problem? So what we would have is we have a network, we have some input, and these values are being fed to different layers. Each layer will take the inputs that it is fed, form some transformation, and, and do some outputs from that layer. The transformation that each layer could perform, it might be something simple, like a biomatrix, it might be some filtering operation, it may be some conversion. All you need to know is to perform some transformation and there are some parameters associated with that layer. When we talk about deep learning, we're talking about networks that have many layers. The number of layers is telling you about the depth of the network. Deep learning, you're typically talking about networks that are either hundreds of layers or perhaps even thousands of layers. Our problem, the input, would be these list of numbers that are the pixel values uh, of the cat and dog pictures. And the output of the network is what we would like to be zeros for dogs and one for cat pictures. So what we have to do is we have to take all of the variables inside this layer, these parameters, uh, think about each variable as real now that we have to set up turning a dial. And we have to tune the dial so that the network produces the correct outputs for the correct inputs. How many parameters will the network have? Well, hundreds of millions of parameters. You have done dial tuning before. For example, when you look at the video in your car, first of all, you tune the first dial to get the radio station, then you would tune the volume of the radio, then you might tune the balance, and so on. This is a very different type of a dial tuning problem. When you start to tune your um, radio, the volume switch is independent of the switch that tunes into the station. So you can first of all tune to the station. Once you've tuned into the station, you can adjust the volume on the radio. In the deep network, if I change the values in one layer, it will change the role of parameters in a second layer. So it's sort of like you tune into the right station, I you adjust the volume and tuning of the station changes. So you have to tune all of the dials at exactly the same time. 
So get a nice mental picture of the problem that you're trying to solve. You've got a rugby stadium full of dials and you're trying to tune all of these dials at the same time so that you get some desired input, uh, some desired output for a given input. To be able to do this, you're going to need a very powerful dial tuning algorithm. So what is the dial tuning algorithm that we use? Well, it starts off by defining the loss function. When the loss function is defined, we've got a desired label for our cat that could be, for our case, it would be not for dog, one for cat. And then we've got an output for our network. And this would depend on all parameters theta that we have. So the theta dependence and the loss function comes in this term over here, the net output. We'll sum over all of the pictures, all of the data samples that we have, and we'll raise this to some positive even integer. So each term is positive. It will take its smallest value when the output of the net matches the desired output. So we've now defined the function and the global minimum of the function, which is the value zero, um, will be reached when uh, the network uh, produces the correct output. Good. Um, so how do we get them? And we're going to use the gradient descent algorithm. And what the gradient descent will do, it will just guide us down to the minimum. So we started at this point over here, we walk to the minimum. The size of each of these steps along the path is determined by this parameter eta. Uh, so that's the step size. And then the displacement of each step is determined by the gradient of the loss function. So we'll just use uh, gradient descent. Um, the other thing I should mention is that part of the power of this dial tuning algorithm is that there are incredibly efficient ways to calculate this gradient. And that's known as propagation. So that's the dial. Now, let's talk about some puzzles. So you now have an idea of what deep learning is. Let's see if this uh, method of solving problems that we've just sketched actually makes sense or not. The first puzzle that we have to solve is that most of the time your loss function is non-convex. If you have a convex function, you have something like this. If you start walking down the hill, you're always going to get to the global minimum. And the only interesting questions you can ask is how fast are you going to get there? What size of step should you use to get there optimally? All sorts of questions like that. But you know that you're going to get to the minimum. If you're talking about a non-convex function, then, for example, if you started with the theta parameter somewhere in this range, you'll never hit the global minimum. You're going to get stuck somewhere else. And in general, if a function is highly non-convex, there are many different minima that you could get stuck at, and you're almost never going to get to the global minimum. In deep learning, the loss functions that we consider, for many examples, we know they're certainly going to be non-convex and highly non-convex. So the first basic puzzle that you have is when and how does deep learning find decent solutions? I've basically given you an argument here for why deep learning should not work, but it does work. So why? Next question is related to overfitting. So I've got one axis here, which is error. The error here is measuring the mismatch between the output of the network and the desired output of the network. So you might think that this is also the loss function. On this axis, we have model complexity. So if you're sitting somewhere over here on the axis, you're talking about a model with very few parameters along this axis. So your model has more and more parameters. Your deep nets are somewhere way out here because they've got so many parameters. When you start to increase the number of parameters that your model has, the way that you perform on your training data, the data that you're using to train the network, that error keeps going down. Because if you've got more parameters, you can fit the training data more and more accurately. You should also ask yourself what happens when you try the network on data 
that was not in the training set. In that case, you find that initially the error goes down, there's a point where it's optimal, and then the error in the prediction of the network actually starts to go up, and that's called overfitting. So this initial case where the error is high but can be decreased, it's called underfitting. This situation where the error is very high and it keeps increasing as you increase more parameters, that's called overfitting. And it's rather easy to understand what's going on. Imagine you've got some data points and we try to fit it with a model. This model is a straight line. All that we can adjust is the y-intercept of the straight line and the slope of the straight line. Well, you can't really follow the trend that you see in the data. You just fit your best straight line through it, and it's not a very good model. If you have more parameters, maybe something like a parabola or even more sophisticated, you can get this curve to bend and actually follow the trend that you see in the data. If you've really got a very large number of parameters, you can produce a curve that will go through every single data point that you measured. Now, of the three cases, this middle optimal case really follows nicely the trend of the data. The first case does not follow the trend of the data. And the last case, you've got this crazy oscillating curve. There's all sorts of noise sitting on top of the data. And that's actually what you're modeling, all of this noise. And it's because you're modeling noise that this test error starts to go up. So the networks should, in normal curve fitting exercises, you find the curve predicts the behavior of uh, what you're studying happens with deep networks. So to give you an idea, a deep network may have something like 20 million parameters. You'll fix those 20 million parameters using 50,000 samples. So you can't possibly fix them all uniquely. There's enough parameters that you'll say overfitting is inevitable because you'll be able to fit whatever noise you have. What you find is pretty interesting. So normal curve, fit, remember, will give you this red curve on the test data and that blue curve on the training data. If you have a deep net, you again get the blue curve on the training data because you can keep fitting the data better and better. But for the performance of the deep network, you get this green curve. So what happens is the more parameters that you introduce, the deep network does better and better. Eventually, this line sort of levels out. Sometimes it might start to increase slightly, very slightly, but you never ever see this U that you would expect from sort of standard uh, curve fitting type logic. It's very hard to understand why deep nets uh, generalize so nicely. Another question is we're talking about deep learning. We know that uh, increasing the depth of the network really improves the performance of the network, but we might ask why. And perhaps the simplest place to ask this question is just a linear regression. So imagine that we've got a problem where the inputs is a set of vectors xk and the outputs are a set of vectors yj. And we'll imagine for simplicity that x, the dimension of x case, so the number of components of x, is exactly equal to the number of components of y. Our problem then, our network has got a single uh, matrix, theta, and these are the weights of our network, and our loss function is trying to get us to fix the weights of this network so that this matrix applied to the input will produce the desired output. So minimizing this loss function means finding a matrix theta that will map the input vectors into the output vectors. Let's now imagine that we study a network that has got two layers. So it has both a uh, eta matrix and a beta matrix. First we apply eta and then we apply beta. Uh, when, if we do that, then the loss function becomes this function that you see sitting over here. And in fact, if you compare the expression that we had to the expression that we have now, you can see that we've just called the matrix theta. We've now called it beta times eta. And um, that doesn't do anything. It's just a relabeling of parameters. 
So this, if you like, is really a very good argument to say that depth does not matter. You've just relabeled the parameters that sit inside your loss function. You haven't done anything else. It's not a different parameterization of the problem at all. But numerical results prove that, in fact, depth does matter. And it matters a lot. In fact, um, okay, it matters a lot. So it matters how many layers you have. It matters how many parameters you have in each layer. At this point in time, there's no theory for how many nodes we should have in each layer or how many layers we should have. This is normally fixed by doing some sort of a random search. And that's our best understanding. Good. Okay, so I just want to summarize these three parts because they will play a later on. So much of deep learning flies in the face of conventional wisdom. So the first puzzle that we had is, you know, why does deep learning work? We're able to find these solutions. And it's part of the because the loss function is highly non-convex, so it becomes unlikely that gradient descent can find the desired minimum. Next question was, why do deep networks generalize so nicely? The number of parameters in the deep network is much larger than the number of data samples. So it seems like overfitting is, is inevitable. And finally, why does depth matter? And if you remember, it looked like we were just relabeling our parameters. So why should depth matter? A matrix is a matrix is a matrix. Okay, so let's now discuss these puzzles and some of the progress that has been made in understanding. Uh, I'm going to refer you to this paper. I've given you the archive number so you can go look it up. It's a really cute idea. Let me tell you the idea of this paper. You have some network. It's a very simple network. It has an input layer, an output layer, and it has some hidden nodes. The network is constructed with 1,000 hidden nodes. You choose the weight of the network any way that you like. You can choose them randomly, or you might have some deterministic rule for choosing the weights of the network. Now, generate a list of input vectors, apply the network to generate the corresponding list of output vectors. So, you know, in, in seconds, you could generate a, a training data set of millions of samples. Now, try to build a second network and train a second network that will reproduce what the first network does. So you build your second network that you're gonna train, you assume it's got N hidden nodes, you take your training data and you try to train the new network. If you set N is equal 1000, so that your new network has the same number of hidden nodes as your original network, well, you know there's a solution, but if you go ahead and try to find it, you don't do very well at all. You, your, your trained network performs very badly compared to your original network. If you change the initial weights, you find different solutions for the weights, and you're really bumping into the problem that the loss function is not convex. So it's not easy to find the global minimum that would give you the original network. If instead you choose n is equal to 5,000 hidden nodes, so you've got an enormous number of additional parameters that you don't need. Now you find that things work really well. If you change the initial conditions for your weights, apply gradient descent, you find different solutions. So the solution that you find in the network depends on where you are. You're always going to a different minimum. But it turns out that all of these different minima are a really close approximation to the true global minimum that you want. So with n is equal to 5,000 hidden nodes, you're actually able to do a pretty good job of mimicking the original given network. So all of these extra parameters, they don't seem to produce any overfitting. What they seem to do is change the loss function so that you've got a large number of minima, and these minima are very similar to the true global minimum that you're looking for. This is a very robust result. This paper has been cited a lot, and people have reproduced this exact result for a number of different network architectures and a number of different data sets, but there's still no theorem to explain this. Okay? So no result here, even though there's a strong hint that there's a result here that should be proved. Okay, next really does matter. And uh, I'm now going to be talking about this very nice paper by Aurora. 
and there is the archive number. So remember we've got this two layer network, that's what the loss function looks like. Now you can do gradient descent on this loss function, taking derivatives with respect to both eta and beta, and you can have a path through eta space, a path through beta space, but at each point you can work out what is beta times by eta, and you can turn these paths in beta and eta space into a path through the parameter space eta. And when you look at what the thetas are doing, so what beta times eta is doing, this is how the theta rule looks. Now take a look, it's pretty interesting. So the new theta is the old theta plus some correction, but this doesn't just depend on the gradient of the loss function now, it depends on the gradient of the loss function at previous instance. So you don't only know the step that you're taking now, you know previous steps that you took. So you can work out your velocity now, but you also know previous velocities. So you know something about your acceleration and even the rate at which acceleration is changing. All of that information is now carried in this path. The second interesting thing that happens is the step size becomes dynamical. And it turns out that when you're getting closer to the minima uh, that you're zoning in on, the step size gets smaller and smaller. So in fact, you have fundamentally changed your dial tuning algorithm by uh, adding another layer. Um, and in fact, another thing proved in the nice result is that this rule cannot be obtained by taking the gradient of any function. So you change your dial tuning algorithm and you've improved it a lot by including a second layer. So depth does matter. Now, this is a bit more on understanding why there's no generalization here. So the first um, point worth appreciating is that the fact that there's no generalization error is not just because we're doing gradient descent. It's not just because of the dial tuning algorithm, but it's actually a property of the data set itself. And that was proved in this paper by Zhang et al. Here's the archive number. And this is a very cute paper. So what did they do? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna phrase it in terms of our cat dog example. So we've got all of our images of cat and dog. Imagine you take half of the images and you scramble the pixels around. So you're just changing the training data and you scramble those pixels around in a random way. So half of the pictures still look nicely like cats and dogs. The other half of the pictures just look a bit crazy because the pixels have been swapped in position, but you keep the dog cat label for those scrambled pictures. In the original problem where you just had dogs and cats and nothing was scrambled, this is the green curve. This is how the error on the test data behaves. It just keeps going down. In the situation where you've scrambled half of the pictures or one quarter of the pictures, now you find that when you increase the number of parameters, you get the U shape. So in this situation, the, the deep network does start to fit noise. You used exactly the same training algorithm in the two cases. The only difference mm -hmm. between these two experiments was the data set that you're using. So the reason why there's no overfitting is not just a property of the, 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 the training algorithm, the dial tuning algorithm. It's a property both of training and of the data set that's playing a role. There's sort of a vague conjecture in the field and it's based on this result that we just discussed and one that I'm going to discuss in a minute. But let me tell you what the vague, vague conjecture is. When trained on realistic data, a deep network's parameters are constrained by data and or training to be highly interdependent. That means they lie on a manifold of much lower dimensionality. I'm going to explain why they lie on this lower dimensional manifold that at the moment shouldn't look well motivated. The fact that it's both data and training, that should look well motivated by this paper. Another comment, properly trained networks have noise stability. And what we mean by that is, again, their parameters lie on a lower dimensional subspace. But let me explain where this lower dimensional subspace is coming from. Uh, this is again a result by Aurora, a slightly different paper. 
Um, what they did in this paper, they had a set of data, they trained a network, the weights of the trained network is just M, very simple one layer network, just performing a linear transformation, which is multiplication by this matrix. So the network has been trained, you have the weights in the form of this matrix M. You put in a signal X, what you get out is M times X. What we're interested in doing now is we put X plus some noise into the network. What will come out is M times the signal plus noise. And what we're interested in knowing is how close is M on X plus eta to Mx? Of course, if eta is very small, then just by continuity, Mx plus eta will be close to Mx. We want to consider the case where eta is not small, eta is big. So the magnitude of the noise is equal to the magnitude of the signal. In this case, what you find for deep networks and some, some chosen data set is that Mx plus eta lies very close to Mx. And here you say you've got noise stability, or equivalently, you can say the network rejects the noise eta. So this is something that's observed. So for networks that show noise stability, Aurora and company did their analysis. What they need to prove, or what they did prove, is that the output of the network, Mx, for a given input signal x, is much greater than the output of the network M eta for some given input noise eta. The reason why it's nice to consider these bounds is that these bounds are really independent of the size of the signal X. If you decide to double the strength of the signal X, the numerator doubles, the denominator doubles, but nothing changes. Now that's a nice parameter to consider and the same thing for the noise. Well, how do you prove this inequality? Where did they prove that it is? For these networks that show noise stability, if you look at the eigenvalues, you have a very interesting pattern. The network they considered, the matrix M, was 5,000 dimensional. And what you find is about 30 of the eigenvalues are large. And that means they go from about 2.5 down to 0.1. The remaining eigenvalues are very small. You know, and very small means 10 to the minus 12. One property of the eigenvalues which are big is that they span a subspace and the data all lies inside that subspace. So there's a very small subspace where this matrix M is concentrated. And that's the meaning of the statement. The parameters lie on a manifold of much lower dimensionality. Inside this 5,000 dimensional space, this matrix M really lives inside a 30 dimensional subspace. When you put your signal on, it all lies inside the subspace. So M will magnify certain components, reduce certain components, but it, essentially, it gives you back something that is roughly the same size as X was. When you're considering something like Gauss noise, the noise is spread evenly over all 5,000 dimensions. And all of the dimensions corresponding to these very small eigenvalues get completely wiped out and eliminated, and that's why M eta is so much smaller than eta. That's why you get this noise rejection. And what happens when you consider multiple layers? So they also consider this, and again, this they could analyze exactly. What you find is each layer develops a small subspace along which the parameters are uh, concentrated. And in fact, the subspace of layer one matches the subspace of two and so on matches the subspace of D. So there's a common subspace for all of these layers that the parameters are uh, concentrated on. All of these theorems are proved rigorously basically because they show networks which are completely linear. They then did study nonlinear networks and numerically they verified that what they saw for the linear networks holds also for nonlinear networks. There's still one interesting question you could ask here, which is we know some of the eigenvalues of the first layer are big, some of the eigenvalues of the second layer are big, and so on up to the dth layer. 
how large are the eigenvalues of the first layer, say, compared to the eigenvalues of the deep layer, you know, the big eigenvalues. And this paper over here, there's the archive number, they prove that the network comes out balanced, and that means the size of the big eigenvalues in each different layer are the same. So the big eigenvalues for all of the different layers take roughly the same size. So now we're starting to learn something about what's special about gradient low bar. That's the kind of solution that they pick out. Okay, I want to mention this um, example, not because it's really relevant for what I want to say next, but because here there was um, something of a proof and it used Langevin dynamics and statistical physics. So this is one example where you saw physicists getting involved and proving something of relevance for machine learning. And here the idea was, when you're using gradient descent to walk to the minimum, you might on the way to the minimum pass a saddle point. And if you do pass a saddle, well, the gradients are getting very small, so you creep very slowly past the saddle. What this paper proved is, if you add some noise to the gradient, that sort of kicks you away from the saddle, so you don't get caught by these saddles and you can walk more quickly towards the minimum. It was proved rigorously that adding a bit of noise to the gradient improves the amount of time for the network to converge, and that rigorous proof used Langevin dynamics. Uh, in practice, this is not much of a result at all, because in fact, whenever you calculate the gradient, you never do it exactly. So there's always noise added in. So practically, this result is not that useful, but it does sort of show you that there's no problem if you've got noise in the gradient. That's not gonna make things worse. If anything, it'll make things better. And the argument used theoretical physics. So that's why I mentioned it. Okay, so some takeaway messages. I think the first one is deep learning is a new way of looking at the world. Uh, it uses very complicated laws and rules that are often not exact. So this is not how we're really used to looking at the world. It's a new way of thinking and it comes with a new set of questions. So this is a new frontier for mathematics and science. And from the puzzles that we've discussed so far, I hope I've convinced you that it looks like deep learning methods can be understood or simplified using mathematics, but there's still a lot to do. I just want to make a comment. Soon we're gonna be studying unsupervised learning. And I just wanted to say that almost nothing is known about unsupervised learning. Uh, Jan LeCun, who's one of the, the inventors of this field, he actually heads up the, the deep learning group at Facebook. Uh, he has a t-shirt that he's fond of wearing and the slogan on the t-shirt says, the revolution will be unsupervised. So certainly LeCun uh, thinks there's a lot to be learned from unsupervised learning. And he has some convincing arguments that really unsupervised learning is a fascinating problem. But nothing is known about unsupervised learning. Here are some more detailed takeaways that are going to play a role in the next part of the talk. First of all, deep learning works on problems for which data sets live on a small subspace of the whole space. Um, deep learning exhibits a certain universality called noise rejection. So these two ideas are going to be important. And finally, so what should we be aiming for? Well, if we can find simple toy models using specific data sets, because we know that the data set is important, the structure of a data set, and using maybe a specific architecture, that's probably a good way to begin. So you might not start off looking for a general theory of deep learning with very deep principles, but you might look for some toy models that have little nuggets of truth in them. And if you get enough of these little nuggets of truth, perhaps you get a way of starting to think about the field and the start of a framework within which you can discuss deep learning. Okay, so now I want to mention some physics, which I guess will be more familiar to you guys. And uh, the physics is related to the renormalization group of statistical physics and quantum field theory. So what does the renormalization group do? Well, you have the following idea. Uh, you imagine starting with physics at some very high energy scale, much higher than what you can measure currently in experiment. So this is called the very short distance theory or the microscopic theory. That theory has many, many parameters. 
Then you use the renormalization group to perform some sort of a core straining, and you land up with a low energy theory. Uh, and there's a systematic way to do that. That's the renormalization group. Now, there's a few fascinating properties of the renormalization group, fascinating enough that they won Ken Wilson the Nobel Prize. What it turns out is, even though the high distance, uh, the high energy short distance theory has an infinite number of parameters, by the time you flow to low energy, the only parameters that are important are what are called marginal and relevant couplings, and there's only a finite number of them. For example, if you're talking about scalar field in four dimensions, you would have less than 10 parameters to specify the theory. The other thing that happens is you can, because most of these parameters actually don't survive by the time you get to the low energy theory, it turns out that theories that have completely different high energy physics flow at low energy to give you exactly the same low energy effect theory. So that's some kind of a universality that's appearing. So these two very deep facts that I've told you about the renormalization group, they seem to match two facts that you heard about deep learning that deep learning works on problems, which the data set lives on a small subspace of the whole space, and that it exhibits a certain universality called noise rejection. I'm going to ask the question, is deep learning an RT flow? And to unpack this question a little bit, I want to know if the ideas and concepts appearing in the renormalization group provide a useful set of ideas with which to construct a theoretical framework for deep learning. So some possible correspondences or you know, ways to approach this. Deep learning works on problems which the data set lives in a small subspace of the whole space. Is this small subspace related to the space of relevant and marginal operators of the renormalization group? So we would love it if we could establish that connection. Secondly, it exhibits a certain universality called noise rejection. So you can put in a number of different um, number of different inputs, uh, but you'll get the same output. That would be the noise rejection. And is this related to universality of the renormalization group? So many different high energy theories may have the same low energy effective theory. And we're going to develop this analogy in a very specific setting. We're going to use the Ising model to generate states of some lattice. And the state of the lattice is going to be our training data, so we'll have many states. We'll use this to train an unsupervised restricted Boltzmann machine. Okay. So, what is a restricted Boltzmann machine? Oh, so let's see what can we do. Okay, so. Restricted Boltzmann machine, what is it? Opposing layers of restricted Boltzmann machine gives a deep belief network. Deep belief networks have been used to generate and recognize images. It's been used for dimensional reduction. So you have a data set, uh, which is enormous. You can reduce it to a smaller data set that still has essentially the same features that the original data set have. It's used for collaborative filtering. So, uh, for example, when you're on YouTube and uh, you've viewed six videos, then all of a sudden YouTube will make a suggestion for you for what's the seventh video you should watch. There, they're using collabor collaborative filtering to do that. Uh, they're used for classification, 2D, 3D, face recognition. So, restricted Boltzmann machines have found the applications. Um, I should also mention that there's some data work. Uh, it's not closely related to, to our idea, so there's the archive numbers. Please take a look. I'm not going to discuss those. I can see that I'm going to run out of time. Restricted Boltzmann machine basically has two layers. It has a visible layer and a hidden layer. So these are really, if you like, some input values and produce some output values. What's significant about this picture is that every... Um, element, every neuron in the visible layer is connected to every neuron in the hidden layer, but there's no connection between visible neurons to other visible neurons and hidden neurons to other hidden neurons. That's why it's called a restricted Boltzmann machine. If you just allow all possible connections, 
then you'll just get a Boltzmann machine. So if you translate this picture into mathematics, there's an energy that comes with it. VIs here are spin variables, plus or minus one. Each VI corresponds to one of these circles in the visible layer. And these circles in the hidden layer correspond to these spins HA, which are also plus or minus one. Here, each visible spin is connected to each hidden spin. So this matrix here is the set of connections going between the input and output layer. And then there's a bias allowed for all of the elements in the input layer and all of the elements in the output layer. Using this energy, you postulate that there's a, a probability distribution for finding a given configuration of the Vs and the Hs. So some configuration of plus and minus one sitting here, some configuration of plus and minus one sitting here. If you want to find the probability for that configuration, plug those plus and minus ones into this energy and evaluate this quantity over here. This looks a lot like the Boltzmann factor in statistical mechanics, e to the minus beta e, and that's why this is called a Boltzmann machine. The way it's trained, you have to calculate certain gradients of this relative entropy. The relative entropy it attains its minimum when this probability distribution Q is equal to the probability distribution P. In this situation, the two probability distributions is the probability distribution defined by the data that you're using to train the network and the probability distribution that's defined by the actual model that you're studying. And these gradients are trying to make sure that the probability distribution of the model matches the probability distribution defined by your data. So this tells you about the dial tuning algorithm, the gradient descent algorithm, and that's the actual model of the RBM. Okay, so what happens with the Ising model? Well, we assign probabilities to some configuration of spins using the Ising Hamiltonian. And what we know is the Ising Hamiltonian uh, minimizes the energy when the spins align. So we're at very low energies, all of the spins point in one direction. So we get this black patch, all of the spins are down. At very high energies, now entropy wins, and there's just an enormous number of configurations with spins up and down. So you're no longer able to align all of the spins. So you get this checkerboard pattern. And at the critical temperature, it's when you're making the transition from this entropy dominated phase to this energy dominated phase. So that's what would happen at the critical temperature. Correlations in this picture would drop off exponentially fast. Correlations in this picture drop off like a power law and there aren't really any fluctuating degrees of freedom in this place. How do we perform the renormalization group for the Ising model as some sort of a coarse graining? Well, we do something called block spinning. So we would average spins and four. So each of these circles on this page corresponds to a spin. We get the coarse grain spin, add these four spins to get a single spin, then move on to the next four, add those to get a single spin, and so on. So we would turn these eight by eight lattice of spins into a four by four lattice of spins, then a two by two lattice of spins, and then, well, just a single spin. That's how block spinning would work. Block spinner normalization group. So that coarse graining tells you your hidden spin is given by averaging the visible spins that are around you. Now you can write this coarse graining rule as the hidden spin is some linear combination of the visible spins. And if you'd like, you can calculate a correlation function between a hidden and a visible spin. And this corresponds to some visible spin correlator that you can calculate from the data set that you're given. But more importantly, the coefficients of your coarse graining rule sit here. So this correlation function depends on your coarse graining rule. And then the quantity that we study, we actually sum over the hidden spins. And what's nice about this is, when you compare two networks, it doesn't make sense to compare detailed weights, but you'd like to study somehow the statistical properties of those weights. And what we're getting here, it's summed, oh, there should also be a sum over A, so we're getting sums over coefficients of the coarse graining rule. So this is actually some quantity that's probing the statistical properties of the coarse graining rule, and of course also the statistical properties of the data set. 
So we're going to be calculating these correlation functions for the RBM and for RG, and we're going to be comparing them. Let me first of all show you what happens if we do this for RG and for a coarse graining that is not block spinning. So in block spinning, we add four spins in by four. Let's imagine we add those two spins and we subtract two of the spins. So if we compare those two, the top three panels corresponds to RG, where we've added all four spins and divided by four. The bottom three panels, we've added two spins with a plus, two spins with a minus, and divided by four. In this panel over here, we are at low energy. You can see that there's basically no correlations. There's no fluctuating degrees of freedom. In this panel over here, where we expect the power law fall off, we've got that sort of a form for the correlation function. And here at high temperature, we've got an exponential fall off of uh, the correlation function, again, what we would expect. So this is what we get from the RG rule for the coarse grain. These three panels over here is the coarse grain rule that is not RG, and you can see there isn't a good match between these curves at the bottom and those curves at the top. In fact, these three curves sitting at the bottom don't accurate, accurately reflect the physics, and they're just not a very good way to do coarse graining. But the point is, the observable that we're studying does distinguish between these two different coarse graining rules. Let's now compare RG to the restricted Boltzmann machine. The first thing that you notice is the size of the correlations are the same. And if you look at the curves, so compare, for example, these two curves at low energy. I mean, there's certain even distinctive dots that you can see in these patterns that are matching very well. Here you have the sort of power law fall off. RBM shows a very similar behavior. In this case, at high temperature, the RG sort of shows this fall off. Well, the RBM is doing the same sort of a thing with the fall off uh, as well, going to zero. And uh, the fall off happens at a different place, but in fact, the correlation functions look very similar. And we haven't only studied uh, two point functions, so let me just mention a few of the other things that we've done. We've studied higher point correlation functions too. And these higher point correlation functions can be used to define couplings of the theory in terms of the higher point correlators. You can study evolution of the couplings with the depth of the network using Kalans and Munzik type equations. And again, there's a nice match between the RBM and RG. What about noise rejection of the RBM? Well, what you can do is you can generate a new data set that's noisy. And the way that you can do that is change the probability with which you create the spin samples and change it by perturbing the Ising Hamiltonian. And you do that by adding a second operator. If you add this operator as a relevant operator and see, does the RBM reject it? It turns out that the RBM doesn't reject it and it's sensitive to the relevant operator that you add. If you perturb the Ising Hamiltonian by an irrelevant operator, then it turns out that the RBM does reject it. So this is some sort of a numerical proof that the small subspace on which the data lives does match the space of relevant and marginal couplings of the renormalization group description. Finally, and this is something that we're still testing, you can invent Hamiltonians for systems that don't have a good low energy effective theory. These are theories for which there are relevant operators, so the theory never stops flowing. And the further you go to low energy, the theory just keeps changing. The deep network in this situation should not find any solution. In situations where there is a nice low energy effective theory, in those sort of situations, um, the deep network should find a solution. So this is one way of tackling the problem. When does a deep network find a solution and when doesn't it? In the RG language, it would correspond to when there is a low energy effective theory, and when there isn't a low energy effective theory. This at the moment is just a conjecture. We're busy testing that now, and uh, well, we'll see what happens. Okay, so some conclusions. Deep learning is a new way of looking at the world using complicated and inexact expressions. It's a new frontier for mathematics and science. Another takeaway, it looks like deep methods can be understood using the methods and ideas of theoretical physics. And there's still a lot to do. A lot of questions remain, which is very good news. I think that uh, theoretical physicists should get involved in this activity. Uh, as far as what we have learned so far, 
I don't think we know yet whether deep learning really is a margin flow. We're gaining more evidence that it is. Even if we find it is an RG flow in this setting, we don't know how general that connection is. Maybe it's only an RG flow if you use an RBM, or maybe it's only an RG flow if you use Ising data, or maybe it's only an, an RG flow if you use an RBM trained on Ising data. So, okay, so I think it's a tremendous attractive idea and it may provide interesting insights into unsupervised learning. Finally, correlation between hidden and visible spins have a sensitive probe which can discriminate RG versus non RG behavior. So, thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Robert, for a fascinating and very, very interesting talk, for a brilliant summary of deep learning methods from the point of view of a theoretical physicist. And um, also, I, I really enjoyed the, 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 the list of puzzles and the systematic uh, resolution of, of, of the puzzle, or at least the way towards the resolution of the puzzle. I see in the question and answers that there are some questions. Ilya, would you like to lead us through the question sessions, please? Yes. Uh, first of all, yes, there is a comment which came from Sebastian Bodenstein, and it's related to the fact that, you know, these traditional pictures of the test and training behavior, and you can see it in the chat, Robert, that there is some kind of development, and uh, there is a link to the, um, to the open AI blog, but it's also, it's, it's, that's a blog which leads you to the uh, archive. And that archive appears roughly the same time, or I think even later your archive. So kind of, you might just consider that. Right. Thanks to, for that comment. To, uh, in your future research. And now we can get to the question. Okay, so first question, first question is coming from Amira. And Amira is, uh, asking it's related to that uh, kind of analysis of the neural networks. So if we mm -hmm. could find a model on neural network with a different eigenvalue spectrum, um, meaning one with very, very few small values and lots of large values, what that could imply for, uh, kind of for your model? Okay. So I think that that would be a situation where deep learning doesn't do very well. So uh, deep learning cannot be used to solve every problem. There are some problems for which deep learning works. It's still not understood when it does work or when it doesn't work. But in these situations where it does work, it's pretty robust and there's good uh, noise rejection. In a case where there's lots of large eigenvalues, then probably if you start from weights with different values, you land up with solutions that don't work very well. One place where this is actually seen is with adversarial nets. So people have, for example, been generating faces of people that they're, they're not real people that exist, they're just fictitious people. And uh, what you find there is when you train the network, quite often you have to restart the training and look for a different solution because the solution that you found was not a good one. And that typically seems to happen when you've actually got lots of big eigenvalues so that your, your, your parameters are not localized on some subspace. Uh. Okay. Uh, and the next question is coming from the Christian Rover, who is asking, thank you for the over overview and interesting results. I have two questions. First one, how important is the nature of loss function, meaning the value of n, which seems to the feature of the eigenvalues, if I'm not mistaken? Okay, good. So um, the honest answer is that we don't have any uh, rigorous results on that, but it definitely plays a role. So for example, in the, in the case where I was discussing this loss function to the power of four, where I was showing you these results, depth does matter. If in fact you replace the four in the loss function by a two, so that you're just summing the mean square errors, in that situation, depth doesn't give you any advantage. And that Aurora proved in his paper. It's only when you have the errors raised to the power of four that you see uh, these nice effects of depth. So for sure, that 2n appearing in the rule plays a role. 
and uh, it remains to investigate which is the best choice for loss function, what works well, exactly what role that 2N plays. Uh, there's no general rules governing that. So this is part of the alchemy that Rahimi was complaining about, that we just kind of guess and see how well does the guess do. Okay, and the second question, perhaps uh, a more weighty question, how much can be said about universality classes in the restrictive Boltzmann machine and fixed points of the RG flows, Gaussian versus non-Gaussian, are boundary effects important, sign and seismic on the network, etc. Okay, so I would say that we can't say very much at all at this point. We've studied one fixed point, which is the Ising model. And um, so we've tried to study the critical point of Ising. We haven't studied anything beyond that. So we don't have any general results, nothing even close to sort of even a conjecture. Uh, so we've studied one fixed point so far. That's the honest answer. So I can't say anything in generality. Okay, okay, because it doesn't seem that we have any more questions from the audience, but can I ask, ask, ask a question? You're welcome. Sure. sure. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, because I, I just, been on, on kind of a couple of virtual conferences on application of the uh, kind of machine learning to the solving of some you know some ground states of the physical Hamiltonian. And over there, of course, there is a huge community of people who is doing restricted Boston machines, but they are now much more moving to the um, using of the uh, deep belief network. So instead of restricted Boston machine, they put down the exponential kind of a deeper network. And according to this evidence, it works much, much better for the kind of interesting multidimensional quantum magnet models and so on and so forth. Sure. So, so what a deep belief network, the way that you get that is you stack a sequence of restricted Boltzmann machines. And uh, so, for example, if you want to see this noise rejection, that you reject irrelevant operators, but not relevant operators, uh, that in fact requires that you have a deep belief network. So that rejection only happens when you have many restricted Boltzmann machines stacked. That, that's a result for a deep belief network. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, then um, ah. one, ah, you have more questions, Ilya? Yeah, we'll get one more question. Okay, okay, please, go ahead. We still have a few minutes. Okay. Okay, is there a fundamental difference between linear and nonlinear network? Is the network easier to analyze, understand? Okay, great question. So linear network is much easier to, to analyze mathematically, of course. So in, in, so as I said, I'm a newcomer to the field, but in all of the papers that I've read on deep learning, the logic is people find a simple toy model version, which is a linear network, they prove the result for the linear network, get some insight into what's going on, and then they usually test the result is also true for the nonlinear network. At this stage, I would say that for mathematical simplicity, of course, the linear example is much simpler, but features that you see happening for the linear network appear also for the nonlinear network. So, um, I mean, I can't say more than that. Thank you. Okay, and I'll get one more question from Ala Basu. Nice talk, Robert. Uh, in some form, the easing mo model slash deep uh, learning network, the training is done over the range of temperature. Is it something true for the Ising model RG and deep uh, restricted Boltzmann machine correspondence you have discussed? No. So we've been using data generated at a single temperature because we're really interested in doing sort of a standard RG type analysis. So um, the reason why you would train it usually on a range of temperatures is that you're trying to actually get the network to detect some sort of a phase transition. And to be able to do that, you need to have some samples both above and below the phase and so on, and then you want to detect where the phase transition happens. We're interested in a different question which is, does the RG flow teach us something about how deep learning works? So we just act at a single temperature, 
we're interested in RG flow of that model at that temperature. And we want to see training at that temperature. Does that give us then a, um, the same thing as RG would? Okay, then um, thank you very much, Robert, for the, for the nice talk. Thank you, Ilya, for moderating the questions. Thank you to, to all the participants who, who might be interested in knowing that uh, Robert uh, volunteered to give us also a more technical webinar for those of you that want to understand more the details of, the, uh, of, this, of his recent work. And we will announce that, um, I don't remember now exactly the date, but sometimes in, uh, in, 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 in August, we already agreed upon, upon a date. So again, thank you very much, Robert, for the, for the nice talk, uh, yeah, for the pleasure. very long distance talk from, uh, from China. Thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, your staying awake long <laughs> in the middle of the night to give us the talk. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we, will, uh, we will announce shortly the, the, the talk for, for next week. Yeah, so thank you very much. Have a good evening and uh, you all stay, stay safe. Yeah. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye.